In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, now we're going to talk about grumbling. We're going to get into a lot of grumbling, okay? And so get ready. So a lot of times people will say, why did the Israelites wander in the desert for 40 years? All you have to do is read Numbers 11 through 21, and you'll get your answer. Ten chapters of grumbling and grumbling and grumbling, 11 through 21. It's actually 11 chapters. So if you start off in chapter 11, and let's just look at how chapter 11 starts. It said, the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes, and when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire abated. So the name of the place was called Tibera, because the fire of the, of the Lord burned among them. Now, the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. I love garlic, so I really love this verse right here. So I, I like to put garlic on all my food. But notice what is going on here. The Israelites are looking back at their terrible condition of slavery, and they're thinking, it was so good. We had all that free food, and we're just eating the garlic and the melons and onions. And you know, they, they have forgotten how bad their situation was. They're reminiscing on their past life that God took them out of. And this is what can happen in our own spiritual life as well. Don't look back. Don't look back. Remember Lot's wife? She looked back. Don't look back. And so you really see this here, that they, over and over again, the Israelites keep looking back to Egypt. And what do they eventually want to do? They're going to desire to return to Egypt. So in a very spiritual sense, Egypt represents all that is worldly, all that is worldly. God took them out of that worldly place where they were slaves, and he set them free so that they could be his people. But they did not understand what it meant to walk with the Lord in faith, because it, when they walked with the Lord, there was one trial after another trial after another trial. And that's what our life is. Our life in Christ is one trial after another, and we must have perseverance, and we must be faithful. So let's see what happened. Verse 7, it says, it says I'm sorry, verse 6. In verse 6 it says, But now our strength is dried up. There is nothing at all but this manna to look at. And, and, and that's really a key verb, verse, because the manna is God's miracle and gift. God is giving them the gift of manna, He's doing a miracle six days a week, and they're going to despise the manna and desire to return to their slavery in Egypt. And many people do the same thing. They come into the church, they're baptized, they receive First Communion, confirmation, and they despise the Eucharist without even knowing that they're repeating the same mistake that the Israelites made in a similar way. And so they're despising this gift. Imagine if you could see a miracle every single day and eat manna every day. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be in awe? And, and this is really something if we think about it. You know, when we come to Mass every day, there's a miracle that takes place during the consecration. And it should change us. This is what happens when we come to Mass and there's true conversion there's also ongoing transformation. The Lord is transforming each one of us. That's what he wants to do. And so we, we, we want to um, open ourselves to his will. There must be conversion for that transformation to take place. And so um, if we go to uh, Numbers chapter uh, 11, we see that as they begin their journey, what do they begin to do? The moment they leave the foot of Sinai, what do they begin to do? They begin to grumble. They begin to grumble, right? And, and, so, and so the journey, is, so it gets worse. So the people are already grumbling in chapter 11. We go now to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, it says that Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman. He was married to a woman, woman from, from a Midianite. Midianite, that's a southern area. The Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said... 
Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it, and now the man Moses was very meek, more than all men that were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of the meeting. And the three of them came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the door of the tent and called, Moses, and called Aaron and Miriam, and they came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is entrusted with all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in dark speech. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you afraid to speak against my, were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And so what's going to happen? Miriam will be afflicted with leprosy and Moses will intercede for her. But the verses that I want you to recognize are two, are two places. First, in, in chapter 12, verse 1, who is now going against Moses? His family. So in chapter 11, the people are against Moses. In chapter 12, his family is against Moses. In chapter 16, the priest and the elders are going, to, going against Moses. Everybody's going against Moses. You see what's happening gradually? People, family, priests, and elders. Now, there might be days when you feel like Moses. Everybody might, you might feel like everybody's against me. But, but what's also interesting is while his own family is, is rejecting him, if you go to verse 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek. The word for meekness here, it could actually mean humble. It has a sense of afflicted. It could mean humble or afflicted. Uh, and, and, and it underlines how Moses is this meek, humble man, the meekest and humble man on the face of the earth. It's a, it's a key verse to understand uh, what God sees in a leader. He chose this man who is the most meek or humble man on the face of the earth to be the leader of his people. Why is that important? Because that's exactly what we see in Jesus when we see our Lord. And, and it, it, so it, it underlines what is really an ideal concept of leadership, to be meek and humble. And it's really important to see this because if you're involved in any ministry in the church, any type of ministry, in any way that you have any responsibility, you know, to pray that you would be meek and humble uh, in any type of leadership role that you might have and that you would treat people uh, in that way. So you can see that rebellion is getting worse and worse. In chapters 13 and 14, they send out 12 spies to go reconnoiter the land. They're going to go to the land. They're going to go throughout the entire promised land, and they're going to come back, and they're going to bring good news to the people of Israel. Do you like this? Good news? And so they go to the land. They look at the land, the 12 spies, one representing each tribe, Ten of them come back and they bring, instead of good news, they bring bad news, a bad report. And only two of them bring good news, and those are Joshua and Caleb, right? They're carrying a big thing of grapes, and they say, look at how fruitful this land is. God is going to give it to us. So two of them bring good news. Ten of them bring bad news. What do you think the people of Israel listen to? Do they accept the good news or the bad news? The bad news, right? They all accepted the bad news. They cried out and they said, we don't, we, we don't want to go into that land. And guess what God said? You don't want to go in? You don't have to go in. You're going to wander in the desert and your children are going to go in. So when you go to chapter 14, verse 22, okay? So if you go to verse chapter 14, verse 22, okay? It says, none of the man... None of the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I wrought in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the proof these ten times. How many times did they test the Lord? Ten times. How many commandments did they receive? Ten commandments. Okay. How many plagues were there? Ten plagues. Are you guys starting to see a coincidence here? There were ten plagues of judgment, then there were ten commandments, and then there were ten times that they tested the Lord to fall back under God's judgment. So they put the Lord to the test 10 times, okay? Very important. And have not hearkened to my voice. They haven't listened to the Lord's voice by being obedient. 
shall see the land which I swore to give their fathers. None of those who despise me shall see it but my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit and has followed me fully. I will bring into the land and into which he went and his descendants will possess it. Okay, and so what it's amazing here is the concept between seeing God's glory and the miraculous signs. Did that bring conversion? Well, you know, they, they didn't have conversion, so it didn't really matter when it came down to it. So, so the Lord says, you're going to wander in the desert. Now let's go now to verse uh, 28. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead body shall fall in this wilderness, and of all your number, numbered from 20 years old and upward, who have murmured against me, not one shall come into the land which I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, whom you said would become prey, I will bring in. They shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your dead body shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness. How long? 40 years, and you shall suffer for your faithfulness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land. 40 days for every day, a year, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years, and you shall know my displeasure. Now, the Israelites had already been in the desert for about a year and a half when this happened. So basically, they would walk in the desert for about how many more years? About 38 more years to complete the 40-year journey. That's really interesting. Well, you know, you, you have a story in John's Gospel where a man was afflicted with something for, I think it's in John chapter 5, uh, 38 years. And so some scholars think that maybe John is looking all the way back to this incident here in the desert. That's kind of an interesting side note. But here we go. Now, the, the people are rebelling against Moses. And when you get to chapter 16, and you go to chapter 16, now it's going to be leaders among the people, the priests and leaders among the people. And so it says, Now Kor, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, son of Levi, and Dothan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on and and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of the Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said, You have gone too far, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he said to Korah and all his company, in the morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. Him whom he will choose, he will cause to come near to him. Now, what's happening here? All the leaders are now rebelling against Moses. Do you see what ha what's happening? Numbers 11, all the people. Numbers 14, all the people. Numbers 12, Moses' own family. Numbers 16 and 17, the priests and the leaders. Now, when you start to do the math, you go, whoa, Moses is losing friends every day, every single day. And you know, it really helps you to understand the books of the prophets, because many, many of the prophets you take like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, they had very few friends as well. Okay, so you can see Moses is losing more and more and more friends. So what is the Lord going to do? Essentially, what's going to happen in chapter 16 and 17 is the earth is going to open up and swallow Korah, uh, Korah and those who rebelled against him. What's really interesting is Korah, a priest, rebelled against the Lord, but his descendants, generations later, um, actually uh, became... Uh, instrumental parts of temple worship. So, you know, his, his, his prodigy, you could say, generations later, they led worship in the temple under King David. So it's kind of an interesting story of how, you know, a son will not suffer for his father's sins. Uh, but the earth opens up and swallows up Korah in chapter 16. And then in chapter 17, 
uh, Aaron has this rod, rod which buds almond, uh, which it buds ripe almond uh, almonds and almond uh, blossoms to show that he's the true high priest. So it's one of the three things that will be kept in the Ark of the Covenant. You will have the, t the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of the commandments, the rod of Aaron showing that he's the true high priest, and also a little bowl with manna. And so the point that I want to make in chapter 16 is, look at who's against Moses. Everybody is now against Moses. And so when you get to chapter 20, you can understand the context. And so in chapter 20, okay, uh, what happens is the people of Israel, it says in chapter 20 of Numbers, the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled together against Moses and against Aaron. Do you see how the people are constantly rebelling against Moses and Aaron? And the people contended with Moses and said, Would that we have died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up to Egypt to bring us to this evil place. It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take the rod and assemble the congregation and Aaron your brother and tell the rock before the eyes their eyes to yield water. Notice he has to speak to the rock, not to strike it, but speak to it. Tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water so that you shall bring water out of the rock for them. So you shall give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them, notice what he does, three big mistakes. Hear now you rebels, Shall we bring forth water for you out of the rock? So he's kind of assuming that he can do it, not God. You notice pride, with pride, it's the beginning of the fall. So shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with, uh, with his rod twice. And water came forth abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their cattle and the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. And now this is really amazing. So Moses and Aaron, they lost faith for just a moment. They misrepresented God. They became prideful. They struck the rock a second time. They called the people a bunch of rebels. And they, they lost it for just one moment. They lost it for just one moment. And here's what our Lord said. You're not going to bring them into the land. Imagine, this is really something amazing. Moses is the one who's the mediator of the covenant. And even as the mediator of the covenant, he will not lead them into the land. And we're going to pick up on this theme when we get to Deut Deuteronomy. But I just want to say, look at how bad the rebellion has gotten. Finally, in chapter 21, you have the story of the people rebelling again, they're being bitten by these fiery serpents, a serpent which inflicted a fiery pain before they died. And Moses is commanded to make a, a, a serpent of, of bronze and to hold, mount it on a pole and hold it up. And if they just simply look at that serpent being held up on a pole, they would be healed. In the New Testament, in John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus says that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, and he will draw all to himself. He uses that special phrase, being lifted up, three different times in John's Gospel. And so this interesting miracle, there's no explanation given. Why would they be healed by looking at a serpent on a, on a pole? Well, serpent, what does a serpent remind you of? sin, right? So maybe in some way they became conscious of their own sin. But 
we can look back now and we say, wow, it was preparing for one thing, for Jesus to be lifted up on the cross and to give his life for our salvation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.